Good morning. Well, first off, let me just say how honored I feel uh, to, to be invited to be here. Um, I was thinking as I was standing here singing and, and worshiping with you guys, how, how strange my ministry journey has been. Uh, I was 19 years old. I was helping to lead this Bible study of kind of displaced and disenfranchised Christians that morphed its way into becoming a church plant. And when the church plant began, I was just a guitar player. I was just the guy who showed up uh, in a sense. So I'm, I'm most comfortable standing in this spot <laughs> over here. Um, and, and that's where I've spent so much of my years of ministry. Um, but I'm thankful for an invite like this. I'm surprised at the way God has called me and, and, um, and when an opportunity like this comes up, I'm, I feel humbled and grateful, thankful for this institution, um, the leaders, the scholars who are here, the pastors, church planners, and missionaries who are gonna be sent from here. So I feel honored to be here. Um, this morning, uh, our scripture is going to come from the book of Job. Uh, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Job chapter 14, that's where we'll be. And Job's a very familiar story, I'm sure for most of us, um, just in way of sort of summary, uh, where we're at at this point in the book of Job. Uh, Job is a righteous man. The Bible goes out of its way to say he was a righteous man. And he kind of had everything going for him. He was wealthy, he had a big family. For the ancient Near Eastern world to look at Job, they sort of looked at Job and said, he's got it all. He's got lots of flocks, he's got a big family, he's got wealth, he's got his health, he's got happiness. Uh, Satan comes along and says, you know God, you've got this servant Job, and he's got everything going for him, and of course he worships you. So what happens when we take those things away from him? What happens when we put him to the test? And so God allows the devil to test Job. Job then loses everything he cares about. He loses his family, he loses his wealth, he loses his health. And by the time the devil is done with him, Job is sitting in a pile of ashes, uh, weeping, mourning, and his wife comes along to him and she's a real peach. She says, uh, why don't you curse God and die? That may be why the devil left her alive. So we're gonna pick up in Job chapter 14. What's, what happens next is Job's friends come along and they begin a conversation with him. Uh, first they sit with him and that's a key thing. For seven days they show up and they just sit with Job. They don't say a word. And in, the, in those days they're being good friends. They show up and they weep and mourn with one who is weeping and mourning. But after, after several days, the conversation starts. And with the conversation, there's sort of an argument that breaks out. And it's this long back and forth for chapters and chapters and chapters. This long back and forth where Job is defending himself and saying, I'm righteous and I need God to tell me why this happened. And on the other side of the argument are his friends saying, no, God is righteous and you need to discover what you've done to bring all of this calamity and harm upon yourself. So let's hear, uh, in the midst of this argument, Job chapter 14, there's this wonderful little meditation on death that Job offers us. So hear the word of the Lord. Man born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away like a fleeting shadow. He does not endure. Do you fix your eyes on such a one? Will you bring him before you for judgment? Who can bring what is pure from the impure? No one. Man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months. You have set the limits he cannot exceed. So look away from him and let him alone till he has put in his time like a hired man. At least there's hope for a tree. If it's cut down, it will sprout again and its new shoots will not fail. Its roots may grow old in the ground and its stump die in the soil. Yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put forth shoots like a plant. But man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more. As water disappears from the sea or a riverbed becomes parched and dry, so man lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, men will not awake or be roused from their sleep. If only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger has passed. If only you would set a time and then remember me. If a man dies, will he live again? All the hard days, all the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the creatures your hands have made. This is the word of the Lord. 
So one of the big questions that Job is asking throughout this book is, why has God allowed this to happen? And does God care that this happened? Where is the compassion of God? Where is the justice of God? Where is the mercy of God? And Job relies on this sense, this belief that he has that he's lived a righteous life. And in this opening passage, in these first few verses, he, where he talks about how man is born of a woman and his days are full of trouble, his springs up like a flower and he withers away like a fleeting shadow, he's, he's overwhelmed by this despair of life, the fact that death comes to all and that it's, that it's indiscriminate, whether you're righteous or you're unrighteous, whether you're good or you're bad, whatever you've done with your life, you will face death. And this idea where he says, they spring up like flowers and wither like fleeting shadows. This is something you see throughout the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. There's a, an emphasis on the shortness of our days and on the immediacy and inevitability of death for all of us. There's an interesting parallel in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter nine, where the teacher in Ecclesiastes is saying uh, very much the same thing. He's saying that whether you're wise or you're foolish, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're righteous or you're unrighteous, death is the great equalizer. It's coming for all of us. In verse two, the teacher says, Ecclesiastes 9, two, he says, as it is with the good, so with the sinful, as it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. And then in verse four, maybe the most telling line, he says, anyone who's among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. In the ancient Near East, this was kind of a vulgarism, that a dog would be better than a lion. A dog was vermin. These are not labradoodles, right? These are, these are scavengers. They eat dead things and sick things and wounded things and trash. And, and in a culture, especially a, a, a Jewish culture, that, where there's such an emphasis on ritual cleanliness, the idea of being a dog is sort of an ultimate insult, where the lion is a symbol of nobility and royalty and honor and power and all of this. And, and what the teacher in Ecclesiastes is saying is, you know, it's better off to be a live dog than a dead lion. Because the teacher at Ecclesiastes is, is, is looking at the world under the sun and he's going, in a world as it appears, under the sun, in the light of day, in a world as it appears, where we don't take into account the transcendent, the spiritual, the presence of God, if we take life on its own merits, then we have to say that life is better than death no matter how you live. And it's this classic argument that you hear all the time, in a world without God, why be moral? Why live a moral life? Job says something that's kind of similar. It's, it's slightly different, but it, it's kind of similar. In verse three of Job chapter 14, he says, do you fix your eye on them? Will you bring them before you for judgment? Who can bring what is pure from impure? What, no one. And Job is summing, if we're all suffer, if we're all doomed to suffer and die, then, then why are you bringing us before you in judgment? What good has my righteousness been, he's asking, if I'm still doomed to suffer and die like everyone else? So he says in verse six, look away from him and let him alone till he's put in his time like a hired man. If we're all dying anyway, God, then why bother us? Why trouble us? Where the teacher says, if under the sun is all that there is, and if there's a world without God, then why be moral? Job is turning the argument back on God. He's saying, if you don't care about our suffering, if you're just gonna leave us to die on this cosmic trash heap, then why do you care about how we live? And why don't you just leave us alone? Interestingly though, Job doesn't welcome death as the end of suffering. He despairs instead that death maintains this power in its world. Some in Job's position would say, fine, I just wanna die now. Just let me die. Let me do as my wife said, curse God and die. But, but Job longs for life. He says this in verse seven, at least there's hope for a tree. If it's cut down, it will sprout again and its new shoots will not fail. Its roots may grow old in the ground and its stump may die in the soil, yet at the scent of water it will bud and put forth shoots like a plant. He's saying, what if death didn't have this rain over us? Wouldn't it be great if there was some power within me like a tree where if you cut down a tree and it still gets water and it has healthy roots, it can sprout again. It can come back to life. Wouldn't it be beautiful? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was some way, some spiritual reality that enabled me to bring myself back to life? 
And you know, in Job's world, a thought like this kind of makes sense because Job lives in a world that, that is a, a very much a pre-modern world, a world full of mystery, a world where the cosmos is, is full of things that we don't understand. He doesn't understand life, he doesn't understand death, he doesn't understand the, the forces of nature and how they work in the world. And, and it's an interesting tr- thing for us to think about from our perspective, because we live in a very different time. We live in a time that a philosopher by the name of Charles Taylor calls a secular age. And, and in a secular age, you're, you're living in a world with a whole lot less mystery in it. We understand the weather. We understand how life works, how the body works. We understand how to define life and death and disease and all of these things. And when you live in a world that's shaped this way, one of the things Taylor says is he says that when you think about the spiritual, when you think about transcendence, you tend to sort of bump your head on the ceiling. It's hard to bring your thoughts into those places especially more broadly in our culture. This is something you see all the time. And so this this impulse that Job has, I think it's a universal impulse. Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, God has put eternity in the hearts of men. We long for a greater connection with our lives. We long for a sense, and we have a deep sense that we're meant to live for more than what we live on this earth. But in a, in a secular age, in a world where thoughts about transcendence and spirituality sort of resist us and elude us as a culture, we begin to look, Taylor says, for, for ways to express that, for ways to satisfy that in an imminent world, in a material world, in the world around us. So what does it look like for us to long for eternity and to long for a life that resists and holds back death in a material world? Well, I think it looks a whole lot like plastic surgery and fad diets and a culture that spends, that that simultaneously spends more money on, uh, on food and calorie intake than any culture in the world and more money on fitness and diet and exercise than any culture in the world. It's a culture that, that, that values youth and enshrines youth. And, and when we find young leaders, we put them into power as quickly as possible because we like seeing young faces and we like experiencing vicariously the lives of young people, stars, actors, actresses, heroes of various sorts, even at times pastors. And so this impulse for eternity drives Job to wonder, man, wouldn't it be great if there were some way that we could stave off death? that we could keep it at a distance, or that if it struck us, that we could somehow regenerate and renew ourselves. But at the same time, Job knows better than this. He knows better than to be fooled by this impulse and this desire to cling to his youth. In verse 10 he says, man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more. As water disappears from the sea, or a riverbed becomes parched and dry, so man lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, men will not awake or be roused from their sleep. There's a line in the the Coen Brothers movie, The Hudsucker Proxy, that gets repeated all the way through the, the, the movie. And they say, when you're dead, you stay dead. That's what Job is saying. When death strikes, you stay dead. There's no, there's no power within us. There's nothing inside of us that can enable us to reach past death and to overcome the grip that it has on our lives. There's no such thing uh, as what you see in the princess bride. There's no such thing as mostly dead. There's only dead. And and what Job recognizes is, is that dead people have no power to redeem themselves. The only thing a dead person can do is lay there and be dead. Or as Robert Capon once put it, the only thing a dead person is capable of is rotting. Job gets it that man lies down and does not rise. And what he says next, though, is fascinating. He says to God, if only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me until your anger has passed, if only you would set a time and then remember me. Tim Keller comments on this passage, and he says one of the things that's so interesting about it is that in this place in cultural history, when when Job emerges in in the storytelling world of the ancient Near East, it's, it's it's a novel thought, it's a novel idea, this idea that somehow life could extend beyond this life. In that time and in that place, nobody else, Keller says, nobody else was talking about this. And what's beautiful in it is that Job turns from himself when we're saying, I have no power for this within me. He turns to God and he says, but if you remember me 
And that little phrase, that little remember me, that is one of the most important phrases in all of scripture. Because remember me is this prayer that you see again and again. God remembered Israel when they were in chains in Egypt. God remembered Hannah in 1 Samuel when she cried out to him in prayer. And the prayer of the thief on the cross just before he dies is he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me. Remember me is this cry of the heart that says, God, I want to know that you care. I want to know that you see me. I want to know that I'm not forgotten. If you would remember me. And Job says, remember me. Set a time. This line here, set a time, this verse, it it literally means set a mark. It's like make a sign for yourself. Write it down on a post-it note. Tie a string around your finger. Set a time and remember me. And I think this little phrase, this verse here in particular, may be the most important phrase for unlocking what happens in this strange book of Job. Job goes on from there. He says, if a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. You will call, and I will answer you. You will long for the creature your hands have made. Job knows the power for resurrection isn't with him, within him, but he turns to God and he says, but you can do this. And the reason he believes that is he says, you will long for the creature your hands have made. Earlier, I, I was talking about how Job's argument with morality is similar to the book of Ecclesiastes. And in, where, in Ecclesiastes, where it says there's no reason to act moral in a world without God, Job is saying there's no reason to act moral in a world with a God who doesn't care about us. Life is empty and meaningless in a world without God, but it's just as empty and meaningless if God is some impersonal force, some cold and distant and disinterested figure, or even worse, a brutal tyrant. So when Job says, you will long for the creature your hands have made, it's an expression of deep faith in the midst of deep darkness. This word long, he's saying, you have this intense desire for us, a deep and profound love for us. And for Job, this somehow frames his world where even though he's lost everything, he can sit and he can wait for God. And he can say, I know that you long for the creature your hands have made. I know that in spite of all of this, that you love me. And there's a key in there for all of us to see that that the only way that we can endure misery and suffering and hardship and pain is by knowing that the love of God endures beyond it and through it. As Keller puts it, he says, God's love is so intense that even if death takes us, God won't let us stay dead. Here's how I think this makes sense of the book of Job. What happens is these arguments essentially continue. And and finally, after chapter after chapter of of, of the debates, God shows up in this whirlwind. And and they've been questioning one another, and Job has been saying, I'm going to question God about this. But God shows up and goes, hey, I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask the questions. He says, brace yourself like a man. I will ask you the questions, and you will answer me. He doesn't answer Job's questions, and he doesn't answer Job's accusers. And and in a way, he's refusing to sort of answer, hey, here's what all this means. Here's what what all this means for you. Here's what's happened, and here's why it's happened. My wife and I had this friend for a few years, and every time something would go wrong in one of our lives, like a friend of ours, someone in our community group, someone in our church, when, when she would hear the story, when she would hear what had happened, she had this way of making this annoying little clicking sound with her mouth and, and then giving a little explanation, you know? So if you got a flat tire on the way to work, she would say, well, I guess God just wanted you to come to work a little early that day and maybe find a new job. Or, you know, if, if someone in your family got sick or, or your dog ran away, she'd say, well, I guess God just wanted you to love him more than your dog. Uh, or if you got food poisoning, she'd say, well, I guess God wanted you to examine the tile in your bathroom a little more closely. <laughs> and this is one of the most frustrating experiences in the world if you're suffering. We've all probably had this. We've all probably had some dark moment and someone comes along and says, this is why this is happening and this is what this means. And they spiritualize it. This is what God, this is why God did this to you. And in a sense, that's, that's the trouble of the book of Job is that they're trying to figure out why did God do this? And God's response to this, the fact that he does, refuses to answer the questions and provide a, a simple explanation for what happens to Job and what happens to to all of these things, I think is illuminating. 
Because you see, when you show up in the life of somebody who's suffering and you go, well, it means this and it means this and it means this, you, there's this thing at work where you're reducing their pain to something that's small and manageable and you put it in a box and you put it in your pocket and you walk away from it. And, and for you, who's on the outside of the suffering, that's actually really comforting. Okay, I can make sense of this thing. But for people who are suffering, they're, they're in this experience of a deep abyss. It's deep, it's dark, it's painful. And so for them, what happens is that you, they experience you putting this thing in a nice, neat little box and being able to walk away from it. And they're left sitting in the darkness. And here's what's crazy about God's response, is that God responds not by clearing up the darkness for Job, but, but by actually making it even more baffling and more confusing. G.K. Chesterton said that God shows up not to solve the riddles, but to compound them. He says, you're trying to make sense of your life? Look around you. Make sense of any of this stuff. The whole world is crazy. And you think you're going to figure it out? You think that's your job? And so God shows up and he says, look at the seas. Look at the oceans. Look at the creatures. Look at behemoth. Look at the ostrich. Where were you when I did these things? Where were you when I created this and I created that and I created that? And in doing this, he sort of enfolds Job in this greater and greater and greater context of wonder and mystery and power and glory and confusion. And Chesterton goes on to say that the secret of God's work is a bright and not a sad one. Because as God does this, he's pointing to the beauty of creation and the wonder of creation and the mystery of creation, all of which remain in spite of loss and suffering. And so for Job, as God speaks, to find himself more and more enfolded into this larger and vast cosmos, he's humbled. And the craziest part is, by the end of the book, Job is happy. Somehow on the other side of this verbal browbeating by God, Job finds himself satisfied. And why is that? How can you be satisfied after you don't get the answers to the question, and in fact, you kind of get humbled and humiliated by a God who says, you think you know? Let me show you how much you don't. I think Job is happy at the end of the book simply because God showed up, because God remembered him, because God did not abandon him to the grave. See, in God's presence, Job discovered that there's something better than having all that he lost, and there's something better than having answers to life's troubles and life's questions. And that, quite simply, is the presence of a God who loves him enough not to abandon him and to cast him over into the grave. In John chapter 11, there's a, a story that I think parallels this beautifully, and that's the story of, of Lazarus, the death of Lazarus. Jesus shows up at the funeral. He shows up in John chapter 11, and, and, and when he gets there, the first thing he does is he goes and he joins the mourners. And in that famous verse that you, you see on Christian t-shirts all the time, Jesus wept. It's a profound moment because he's showing up in the lives of people who are suffering and he simply joins them and weeps with them. He doesn't offer the explanation. He doesn't tell them what's gonna happen next. He doesn't, he doesn't just say, hey, don't bother with crying. He's gonna be alive in just a few minutes. He'd rather sit, join them, weep with them, experience the pain and the sorrow and the suffering of the world with those who are experiencing it themselves. And then he goes to Lazarus' sister and he says, hey, have them take the stone off the grave. And her response is great. She's like, you know, he's been in there a few days. It's not going to smell good. And that, again, brings us back to Capon's wonderful line that the only thing a, a dead person can do is, is rot. And Jesus says, hey, I've got this. Open the grave. And he opens the grave and he calls Lazarus' name, and Lazarus answers him. When Jesus is weeping for Lazarus before he calls his name, some people said, well, why didn't he fix this before? Why didn't he, why didn't he get here earlier and, and heal Lazarus? He could have prevented this. And again, it shows that universal impulse that when suffering strikes, when hardship strikes, we want to have answers. We want to make sense of it. 
And Jesus resists taking that moment as a teachable moment and saying, here's what I'm going to do, and here's how all this. Let me tie this up for you. He simply weeps with those who weep. And as he weeps with those who weep, they say, see how he loved him. And so like Job, Lazarus descends into the grave, and out of this overwhelming love, out of a longing for the creature that he made, Jesus calls his name, and and Lazarus answers him. So this morning, as we as we think about this story and as we think about what it means to find ourselves in places of suffering, I can't help but think about a room full of people who are moving their lives in the direction of ministry. And I've been in ministry for 16 years, and and I've been in a context and a situation that I think in the grand scheme of things is pretty good, pretty comfortable. When I think about what church, what pastors, what missionaries, what um, what Christian people through the centuries have, have endured, and Christian people around the world have endured. And nonetheless, in a pretty comfortable place, in a pretty comfortable context, it's been real hard. I've been called out in local newspapers and, and mocked for having traditional beliefs about sexuality. Uh, We've had people show up at our church on Sunday mornings and protest. We've had people uh, deliberately break into pastor's houses and throw eggs because we were in in a a, uh, a really depressed urban neighborhood, and, and people were embittered that we were there. We've seen the ordinary kinds of suffering that happen in every single church people close to us, people who find themselves with a three-month-old baby and a brain tumor, friends of ours who are doctors who come to community groups exhausted and tired and say, I lost three patients on the table this week. We've seen addiction spring up, not just in the people in our pews, but in the people on our staffs, and, and at times in people in our own families. We've seen friendships abandon us. We've seen uh, pastors and leaders, close friends, fall into great sin and have to be removed from their roles and their leadership. And so I say all that to say it doesn't matter where you're going with your life, whether you're going to be a pastor and a leader in a church here in North America, whether you're planning to go to the mission field, or whether you're planning on just trying to be a faithful Christian in a church in any place on this earth, we're inevitably going to find ourselves in places where we we are surrounded by darkness, we're surrounded by suffering. And in those moments, we're, we're going to want to look at the situation and we're going to go, how do I make sense of this thing? What's God doing here? What's God doing in this moment? How do I tie this thing up and make it something that I can manage? And I want to encourage you, there will be times where you'll be able to look back on circumstances and go, oh, I can see it now. And there will be times where you can't. And I'll say this, more often than not in the moment, you won't be able to make sense of it at all. But while those answers may elude us, what the scriptures promise us in the life of Job and in the life of Jesus is that while answers elude us, we can be certain that God himself will not abandon us. He will not leave us, he will not forsake us. In fact, as far as I can tell, only one person in the whole scripture ever calls upon the name of the Lord in a moment of darkness and is denied his presence. And that's Jesus himself who cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me from the cross? But there's a good reason for that. For all this, when you're dead, you stay dead kind of talk, only one person in all of history could go to the grave and walk out on their own power. And that was Jesus. And because he was forsaken at his darkest hour, we can have confidence that we'll never be forsaken. And because he had the power within him to walk out of that grave, we can have the confidence that no grave will hold us either. Let's pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, darkness and suffering still cover the earth, but we know that your light shines in the darkness. We know that your voice echoes in the tombs and that your hope fills our hearts. 
Lord, may we with confidence turn our trust to you in whatever darkness we may experience, whether it's now or it's in the future. May we know as Job did, as Lazarus did, may we know you as a God who meets us in our suffering. May we hear you call our names, and by the grace and mercy of our King Jesus, may we answer you and walk in renewed life and joy. Amen.